Welcome to another episode of Arrow Bandwidth, the podcast series designed to bring you information and news about the latest technologies, vendors and trends affecting the IT industry today. As ever, this show is brought to you by Arrow Electronics. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, my name is Gareth Fraser-King. I am the Technical Solutions Director for MIR, and I have with me Adrian Duckenfield, who's a senior SE at FireEye. Do you want to tell me a little bit about what you do? Yeah, hi, Gareth. So, yeah, I'm a a senior sales engineer aligned to some of the major accounts here in the UK. I actually work with some of FireEye's largest customers, which makes it a, a pretty interesting role. Let's just, first of all, I'd like to ask you about the challenges that the you know the CISO and the security teams have in some of those larger accounts. We we know that you know there's a shortage of skills. We know that there's some very complex processes, and we know there's a bunch of solutions that are used. You know, in your experience, what are security teams up against? Yeah, they do face some pretty significant challenges on a daily basis. I mean, as as you're aware, the the attacks that we see now are becoming more and more sophisticated. And the challenge with that is you have to have more and more inventive ways of not only protecting yourself from these attacks, but also having the visibility of the attack across the entire at- uh, attack lifecycle. And that could be pretty difficult to achieve. The problem is you, you go out and you invest in a lot of tools, but some of the challenges the business is going to face are having the technical knowledge in-house to actually not only deploy the tech correctly in the first place, but actually understand what it can do and being able to configure it effectively to you know, make it a useful tool and get the best value out of the product. From a CISO's point of view, it's pretty difficult staying ahead of the curve, I think, trying to know what's coming next and also having the, the confidence in what you have in-house will actually protect you from the latest attacks of today. And it's a double whammy, really, isn't it? Because not only are you always after the fact in in terms of protecting yourself from the bad guys, but also the way that security is built around the infrastructure tends to be after the fact as well. So a company needs a new service, so they have a new app and they have a new server or they put it out in the cloud or whatever they do with it. And then security tends to be thought about afterwards. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think something else we see as well is, you know, when some of the businesses do get attacked and they make headline news, it's usually at that point that the other businesses in the same industry then start to react and to do something to it. But quite rightly so, as and when they're improving services in-house and adding new functionality to existing services, they need to make them secure. But without knowing exactly what's going to target you and how they're going to do it, I think it's quite challenging to know how to secure it in the best way. So security audits of some sort, shape or size makes absolute sense simply because as a CISO or you know, part of that security team, you are unaware if you're completely covered and all the, all the services are protected. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's quite common really to see businesses using things like you know, red teaming, blue teaming, purple teaming and penetration testing. And those are all very valuable services and you absolutely do require these to make sure you know you you are as secure as you can be but they come with some limitations typically they don't really represent a real attack usually with those kind of scenarios and services you will run a bunch of tests you will kind of already know what's on the network already and that could be down to even what version of software something is running so you already have a pretty good idea of what vulnerabilities could be in place so they're a little bit limited it's not quite the same as a true attack I remember years and years ago, uh, there was a guy I knew, so he was in charge of keeping the servers going. I mean, that was basically his job. And you manually had to go and look at each server to make sure that they were working. And, it, and it's a bit like that. It's the kind of the dark ages. We don't have a way of ensuring that we understand and know what's working, what isn't working. Yeah, it, it's absolutely true. I mean, with, with today's services, obviously customers are now using Seams and they've been on the market for a few years now. But the problem with a Seam is they're firstly, incre- they can be incredibly expensive to actually spin up and get tuned. The problem with them or the challenge customers have with them is actually getting value out of them at the end. I mean, as, as you know, a lot of these things can ingest a lot of alerts, a lot of information. And it, of course, it's the old find the needle in the haystack. 
So a lot of the tooling and the services that businesses are using will feed into the scene. But if they're not correlating the information correctly, if they're not actually identifying potential evil on the network, then unfortunately the tool isn't as effective as it can be. So the visibility could be there, but if the tool isn't tuned correctly or you don't have the correct people in place to actually manage that, it can be a little bit difficult. Yeah, that brings us on to something else because um, one of the things that FireEye has quoted is that we reckon there's going to be 3.5 million open security jobs by 2021. Is that why you think that it, it takes so long for us to discover and act on breaches? Yeah, so I think there's a number of vectors that come into play here. Certainly, people is one of them, the people that you have in-house. And it's challenging for businesses today because it can take a long time to find the right people to do the right job for you. And when you do employ them and you get them up to speed, you have to train them on all of the different tech stack that you have, potentially. You have to keep their job interesting. And the problem is, if the tooling isn't doing what it's supposed to do in the first place, the person's going to spend an awful lot of time doing things that they didn't expect to do, i.e., you know, sieving through hundreds and thousands of events and alerts, trying to find evil. A good analyst wants to do that to a degree, but they also want to go hunting. They want to go and find evil things in the network which may not have already been detected. You know, they want to do threat research and so on. So it can be quite difficult if the tooling isn't there to actually help them. If it's painful to use, if it's not giving them the level of visibility they need, then it's a big challenge. We reckon that, you know, with a big organisation, there's around about 10,000 daily alerts, which is just, I mean, you'd have to have a vast team and very sophisticated process to be able to sort through that lot. So, you know, when you have a, a security team, they're relying on all the tools they have, they're relying on the people and the processes they have, but they, they have to make assumptions, like we mentioned earlier, about you know, whether or not all of the infrastructure is protected correctly. But what other assumptions do we make? Yeah, exactly. You know, once the technology is deployed, there, there's a lot of assumptions that are made, really. So, for example, a, a new attack might come out and it's quite sophisticated and you need some new tooling to take care of that. So you will go out and, and you'll purchase that. Then your teams will go ahead and deploy that technology. And then at the end of that, you assume that you are now protected and you are secure from that attack. And that's one of the challenges of today is it is all just made up from assumptions. You assume that the technology that you purchased actually does what it claims to do. And that's something which is actually quite difficult to test against, I think. You also assume that the NOC team or the SOC team that deployed the technology understood the technology clearly. They understood how to get the best out of it and how to configure it correctly. You also assume that, well, that's fine. Maybe the tech is deployed correctly. But there's also the assumption that the people and processes at the other end of that know how to respond to it and deal with that as and when something happens. And then you assume that over time, things don't change. Now, what I mean by that is, you know, if somebody has to make a change on one of the pieces of tech stack, for example, how do you know you haven't broken something else by doing that? How can you test for that? As I mentioned there, there's a lot of assumptions and with assumptions, as you know, there's a lot of room there for mistakes to be made. And it's quite difficult to be assured that all of those processes that have taken place there are actually effective and don't change over time. Configuration drift, which happens all the time. And if you if you then stack that up and chunk it up, it, it becomes environmental drift. So what impact does environmental drift have on the security posture? So with environmental drift, it, it's quite risky and dangerous in the sense that things can change, whether it's configuration or processes. It's difficult to identify that those changes have actually happened. So the risk behind that is somebody could have made a change to a service or a system in the security tech stack. And unknowingly, it's actually created a vulnerability somewhere or it's opened up a security gap. And the risk is that doesn't get detected that there's no visibility because it's not going to turn around and tell you you shouldn't have unticked that because now there's a gap. So until actually something malicious happens and gets through, that's typically the first time that you know that that mistake had been made. So there was a story that I heard fairly recently about a DLP server that had been con you know installed and configured and was actually owned by the risk management part of the business, not IT. And IT came to a refresh and refreshed, but didn't back up the configuration and then failed over the application onto the, the new machine. 
and none of the configurations went with it. So actually, the you know, DLP had been doing nothing for about six months before somebody found it. Wow. Yeah. Just... OK, I think we'll leave it there. Thank you, Adrian. And we'll create part two where we talk about how we deal with the uh, solution to that problem in another podcast from FireEye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth. Thanks for listening to another episode of Arrow Bandwidth. If you'd like to hear more, please click and subscribe to our channel on your preferred podcast app. Follow us on Twitter at Arrow Global or learn more about us at our various websites, including www.arrow.com. Thanks for listening.